Today, we are reading and learning the double Torah portion, Vaikal Pikudei. Why is this Torah portion double? The reason is that every few years, the Hebrew calendar adds an additional 13th month to its yearly cycle. This month is called Adar Bet. It is done to adjust the Hebrew lunar calendar to the international solar one. We add the 13th month every few years to keep the holiday cycle in accordance with the year's season so that the Passover will always be in the spring. In the rainy season will always begin around the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. But the 13th month year is longer and it has more Saturdays in it. So we need additional Torah portions for the additional Saturdays. During that year, we read the double portions separately. On the regular year, we read the double portions as one. And on the extended year, we break those portions into two different ones, thus providing us additional portions. This week, we conclude the book of Exodus, which ends with the construction of the tabernacle. And what happened then? God himself came down from heaven to dwell in the sanctuary. The Lord entered the house built for him by the children of Israel. This happens at the end of this Torah portion. At the beginning, Moses gathers the people of Israel and for the fourth time in the Bible, commands them to keep the Shabbat. For six days, work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a day of Sabbath rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. Based on this text that forbids doing any work on the Shabbat, our sages created a list of 39 types of labor that are forbidden on the seventh day. Those forbidden trades are those that were done during the construction of the sanctuary, like building, sewing, coloring, and so on. Our Torah portion begins with the Shabbat. Yes, even during the construction of the tabernacle, even while building the house for God, six days you shall work. And on the seventh day, on the Shabbat, you should rest. The children of Israel answered the call of Moses. They brought offerings and volunteered their best and they're most talented for the construction of the sanctuary. The book of Exodus ends with God coming down to dwell in the house that the children of Israel built for him. God Almighty, who created everything and everyone, came to dwell with human beings. This ending tells us that finally, after focusing on the smallest details, after all the hard work, when we act wholeheartedly, donate wholeheartedly, God comes to dwell in our midst. This understanding is very important, as we have to be precise in the smallest details. And before praise, before praying, before the teaching, we have to start with treating each other well. We must receive our guests with kindness, try to understand one another, understand what the person next to me is going through, and not to put myself in the center of the world. Contrary to what we might think, the main focus of the scriptures, both the Bible and the New Testament, is on the person next to us, 
on our neighbor. It is not me or my faith. My faith is not the center topic of the scriptures, but the way I treat others is. There is a well-known Jewish saying, proper behavior precedes the Torah. And we understand well its meaning and can easily explain it. It belongs to Rabbi Ishmael, who understood that long before the giving of the Torah, the scriptures required from us to act properly towards one another. Meaning that righteousness, moral behavior, is the foundation for our knowledge of the Torah. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? The one who has clean hands and pure heart. Honest and righteous behavior is required as a foundation for our study of the Torah. Meaning that we cannot touch the Torah without basic moral and caring attitude to our surroundings. Obviously, this need is even greater when we dare to come before the Lord. In our prayer house, when we stand in the house of God, the Holy Spirit will not be there if we do not pay attention to the details around us, great and small alike. And in my book, the greater things include our honesty and behavior towards others. And the lesser things are the different customs and traditions that connect us and give us our common identity. If we will do everything with love, God will come and dwell in our midst. And we ask, where will He dwell then? Will God dwell inside of us individually, as some people call it the divine spark in us? Or will He dwell among us as a people, as a nation? Basically, we see each person as the temple of God, meaning that God and His Spirit dwells inside every believer. This understanding or belief is based on the words of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? This is why, as believers, we talk about being born again when we begin to live according to the Word of God, for the glory of God, because of the Spirit of God lives in our bodies. As the followers of the Messiah, we believe that the Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts of every person who has invited God to his life. But we also believe that there is an interaction between our surroundings and the way we live and act. In Genesis, in the story of creation, we quickly learn that people are not meant to be alone. As God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And all through the book of Exodus, which we conclude today, we witness the birth of the nation of Israel. And here too, the person is not meant to be alone, even in his connection with God, as the promise and the salvation of God is for the whole nation. We are familiar with the term minyan, a rule that certain Jewish prayers could only be recited with a group of ten or more men. Nine people, even if they are complete saints, cannot make a minyan. A minyan is created by ten standing together, even if we do not know them. Even if we stop a person in the street for a minute without knowing if if he even believes in God or keeps his commandments. Nevertheless, such a person can complete the minyan. The idea behind this is that people's identity is not as important as their joining together 
as one community, one congregation. Then the divine presence comes to dwell in their midst as a congregation. I have to say that I don't entirely agree with this approach. I agree that it is important to belong to a congregation or to a group, but the faith in the purity of hearts of those standing together in prayer is just as important. Bringing a stranger who is not part of our prayers or our joint experiences would rather harm our prayer, its intentions and unity. I think it would be better to pray with a smaller group of people and if necessary, skip certain prayers. In the New Testament, Yeshua teaches a principle similar to Minyan. He is teaching the importance of joining together in prayer, but the exact number of the individuals in that group is irrelevant. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. We learned from the story of the tabernacle that God dwells in people's hearts. But this is not all. We were created as part of a society, as part of a nation. And God dwells in us as a group, as a nation, and not just in me as an individual. The ending of the book of Exodus is exciting and glorious. God's presence fills the tabernacle. And no man can enter it, not even Moses, that same Moses that talked face to face to God, that Moses whose face shone brightly after meeting with God. He was not able to enter the sanctuary or even come close to it. It means that the presence of God is stronger and greater when he comes to dwell in the congregation, among the people as a whole. That is why an important part of our faith in Yeshua is our relationships with other believers. In building a fellowship, a congregation, being in fellowship means to share our lives with each other, to become partners and companions. And here, in the fellowship, dwells the Spirit of God. The Apostle Paul calls it the body of Messiah. We believe that every person in the congregation, it's every member, is a world of his own. In the presence of God, the Holy Spirit dwells in him or her. But in addition to that, he is part of a larger social body. And in this body, that we call a congregation, the Holy Spirit dwells as well. The New Testament teaches us the importance of the community and the responsibility for the peace and unity in the community. It all rests on our shoulders. In the parable of the lost sheep, Yeshua teaches us the responsibility for finding and bringing back home to the fellowship those who left. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Yeshua describes a person who left the fellowship. And in this parable, he demands from us, the community, to go and help that person. This parable is a strong message. It teaches us the sense of responsibility for one another. 
Yeshua teaches us a parable that is very similar to a popular Jewish saying. All Israel is responsible one for another. Yeshua is telling us to take responsibility for one another. And if one is falling out of the fellowship, wandering off from the straight path, all of us in the community are guilty and responsible as well. There is no me. There is no you. If there is a punishment, then we, for example, the whole nation of Israel, receive it. We are guilty together. That is why Yeshua is teaching us, not as a recommendation, but as a duty to follow those who left the community, who separated themselves from the public. And it is our duty to bring them back home. Yeshua is telling this parable to the scribes and the Pharisees, to the sages and elders, as an answer. He is telling them this parable because they raised questions and complaints about Yeshua spending time with sinners. Why? Why is he willing to sit with the sinners? Why isn't he teaching those who wish to hear? Those who are interested in learning. Why is he, Yeshua, willing to invest time and effort in those who wandered off from the straight path? Those who are lost. Answering them, Yeshua is telling this parable, meaning that we are responsible for each other. We must go and try to bring back home those lost sheep. And if we did not try, we bear the guilt. This parable of Yeshua puts a lot of pressure on our shoulders. Instead of thinking that every person is responsible for his own actions, that his choices do not touch me, Yeshua is teaching us something different, that the common responsibility affects everyone. If we know of someone who left the community, it is our responsibility to check why. And are we able to bring him back? Even more so, everyone has to ask himself, was it me who pushed him away? And maybe the more relevant question is, did I help enough? Did I participate in building the congregation where we care, help, and support each other? Did I do enough? We do not live in a vacuum. Our actions affect others. Maybe we are small and insignificant as individuals. I say maybe because we can argue that every person is worth the world. But what about us as a group, as many people, as a congregation? When we come together in the name of God, in His glory, the Holy Spirit will come upon such a congregation with great power and holiness. When wandering in the desert, the people of Israel volunteered and did the work wholeheartedly. They donated silver and gold and other materials. They gave much. Moses had to order them to stop the offerings, as it is written. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained for bringing more, because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. The willingness of the people to give and to cooperate together in unity brought us to the impressive ending of the book of Exodus. When God filled the sanctuary, when God came to dwell in the midst of those people. And that is it. That is the glorious end of the book of Exodus. And the only thing left to us to conclude is with a traditional saying, Chazak, Chazak, 
ונתחזק. Be strong and courageous. Shabbat Shalom.